So good evening again to everybody who's joining us uh, today. Thank you very, very much for, for, for coming along this evening um, to Plant Life's Fall Into Nature series, uh, which has been running right throughout the whole of October. And I hope, I hope some of you have, uh, have enjoyed some of the previous presentations and talks that have been running. Um, and, um, and also, if you haven't been able to sort of join us for some of those, then they are all available. Most of them are available on the YouTube channel. Um, so I'll give you more details of that in a minute. But um, as I say again, thank you very, very much for joining us this evening uh, for this talk on juniper conservation in, in the Wiltshire wild, uh, in, in the Wiltshire landscape. Um, my name's Alistair Morley. I'm head of important plant areas for for plant life um, and I'm here to introduce a couple of wonderful speakers this evening but just before I do that um, I'm hoping that everybody can can see and hear okay um, if you have any problems at all um, we have a wonderful lady called Becky who's going to sort out any technical problems so if you've got issues at all technical problems if you could use the chat function and Becky and we will try and sort out any difficulties that anybody has um, I should just say that we're, we're uh, recording all of these uh, sessions so that we can make them widely available to people who haven't been able to make it on the evening so they will all be on uh, the YouTube channel and again Becky will provide a link to that at some point during the evening as well so that you can um, catch up later and, and see some of the other ones um, uh, we've got two fantastic speakers this evening, and as you'll see from the, the, the first slide there, Matt Pitts and Andy, Andy Byfield, and they're going to take us through a little bit of a story of, of, of juniper conservation and the project that we're working on at the moment. Um, they're going to talk for around about 40 minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes, um, and we should have plenty of opportunity for, talk, for questions afterwards, um, and I'll try and gather those together and, and, and be putting those to Matt and Andy at the end of their talk. So if you can pop any questions that you have in the Q&A function and I'll keep, a, keep across those. And as I say, we'll address as many of those as we possibly can uh, at, at the end of the talk. Um, uh, just a very, very brief introduction to, to Andy and Matt. So Andy's going to sort of kick off with a little bit of a, uh, a quick run through of the, the, uh, the importance and the conservation of, of juniper, um, this iconic species. And Matt will then follow on um, uh, talking in a little bit more detail about the project that we've actually got on at the moment, um, particularly in Wiltshire. Um, some of you may have heard of Andy before. Andy was a founder member of Plant Life all those years ago, um, has worked with us for, for many, many years and has been instrumental in the, in the Juniper work that we're now undertaking. Um, and it's fantastic to an, have Andy along for the evening. And Matt Pitts is uh, Plant Life's Meadows Advisor, um, very much involved with uh, species rich grassland creation and, and in this case, the Juniper conservation work that's happening in the Wiltshire, uh, in the Wiltshire countryside. So I think that's probably pretty much um, enough from me. So uh, with no more ado, I'm going to just hand you over to Andy Byfield and I hope you very much enjoy this, this evening. Thanks very much, Al. Um, I'm hoping you can all hear me. I have no idea how many people are out there, but he hello from Devon uh, to start with. Um, what I want to do first before Matt goes on to the current bit of the project is just to sort of explain really how we got to working on juniper and really a bit about juniper as a species and what we need to do as conservationists uh, to save it in the, uh, the certainly the lowland British landscape. So what we're discussing, uh, both Matt and myself, is juniper in the lowlands. And um, we're particularly looking uh, in southern Britain, particularly on the chalk downlands. Um, and I'm going to just give you a bit of an overview to start things off. Um, I'm assuming probably everyone knows junif junipers, but it's just worth rem reminding ourselves that juniper is one of our three native uh, conifers. So yew trees there with the red berries uh, are, are the second one and uh, Scots pine are the third one. Um, just worth mentioning them because all of them in their own little way um, are key uh, iconic species in our landscapes around the British Isles and they create habitats that I think, and indeed uh, conservationists in general think, are hugely important uh, places for wildlife. Um, I don't know how quickly these are sort of flipping along, but I'm hoping that you're now starting to see a couple of the, or one of these landscapes, which is of course the Scots pine, Caledonian pine forests, 
of the north. Um, hugely important and a great, great uh, species that's being pushed through rewilding these days. And again, hoping that this has appeared. Um, if we're sort of keeping up slidewise with the talk, um, if you think about yew trees, it's the yew ash beech woodlands of our southern uh, uh, chalk hangers uh, that are so important. So this is a place in Hampshire, this is on the East Hampshire hangers, uh, a place called Ashford hangers, and you can see there a bit of ash dieback on the left, but a bit of yew tree on the right. And then finally, finally, um, I don't know whether you can see that, but that's Porton Down, um, probably our largest surviving area of old long-standing plateau chalk grassland in Britain and certainly some of those bushes out there on Porton Down are junipers. So you've got um, these three species in iconic British landscapes um, and it's worth sort of actually saying that juniper itself is probably the most, well certainly is the most widely scattered of those three species and you should have a map there which shows its distribution across Britain. Um, there's a big gap in the middle, um, but there's a big load in the south and a big load up in the north. It's worth saying that they grow from sea level, this is juniper, right up to a thousand meters in Britain. Um, they grow from the coast all the way inland and it's one of those funny old species, pretty Catholic tastes, um, that will grow on chalklands, uh, calcareous uh, alkaline soils all the way through to acid soils. So it comes as a bit of a surprise that here is a species that's not really doing very well in Britain. But before we get there we better see this slide. Um, Mims and I are talking about the lowlands uh, and I'm going to see if I can get my little uh, little thing to hang on there we'll get a pointer in a minute. Um, we're talking about the southern bit of Britain here. Hopefully you can see the pointer. Uh, the first thing to say about this is this is a BSBI map or it's using Botanical Society data and uh, somebody here has been rather keen wandering the streets of London recording juniper. So you've got this big area here of introduced junipers. Uh, so he probably would think that um, London's the place to see juniper. But as a native species you can see our chalklands coming down here, this pale uh, minty green here. You can see the Chilterns there, if you can see my pointer. You've got the Goring Gap there, you've got the Berkshire Downs there, the Downs around Devizes is there, and then you've got this great bulk of um, chalk uh, down in Wiltshire, Salisbury Plain and the like, uh, before the Chalkland and the Junipers carry on along the North Downs there and the South Downs there. A few other places to mention, one is the Oolite here, which has um, the Cotswolds and has a good number of Juniper colonies still. And then there's odds and sods, a few in the New Forest, good quantities on the, the Gower limestones, a few around Burnham Beaches and on the acid caps on the Chilterns and this very famous colony right down in the southwest, which is uh, Var or subspecies Hemispherica down on the Lizard. I mentioned that it's declining. Um, this just shows you a bit of the decline. You can probably see there that on the Chilterns, only one in seven of the colonies, or one in seven of every colony still survives. On the South Downs in Sussex, uh, two thirds of the colonies have gone. And even in Wiltshire, which today is really uh, one of the strongholds for the species in the South, well, nearly half the populations have gone there. It's worth then talking a little bit about the, the plant as a species. And it's a funny old one because in some ways, it has almost human characteristics and I'll explain why. The first then, here on the left hopefully, uh, is an old illustration of juniper and it highlights the fact that you get male ones and female ones, you get boy junipers and girl junipers. There is the female and it's worth just noting that at this time of year if you look at a juniper bush you'll find find ones with lovely uh, purple berries that are ripe now but there's a second cohort of berries coming along that will ripen next year so at any one state or sorry at the time when one uh heart, you know harvest if you like or one crop is ready you get a lot of green berries as well which will go on uh, to to fruit the following year the second thing to say about it is that there's the, the male there, it's a wind pollinated tree, very much like uh, 
Scots pine. And so you can start to see that as populations become more disparate, more widely scattered, as individuals become more widely scattered in the countryside, you're going to have this problem that the males producing abundant uh, pollen won't necessarily be pollinating the, the female bushes. The other human trait is this one that you see on this picture, which just sort of shows that here you've got a species that lives to about 100 years old. They're not very old, long-lived species. They go on for 100, 130 years, and really, a, a bit like humans, they sort of lose their sexual drive, if I can put it that way, and as they get older, they become less and less fertile. Another characteristic, which I think tells us more about their ecology than anything else, is they're pretty slow growing. Um, so a typical juniper uh, of the southern lowland sort uh, would be perhaps two, three, four metres high. And particularly in the first 10 years, really, they're slow growing species. Uh, so they need bare ground in which to survive. So if you're a juniper and you found this area of bare terrain here in this slide, um, you would uh, colonize that very nicely and because you're slow growing and because this is such a sort of sterile habitat you wouldn't find that you were cr being crowded out by grasses or other shrubs. So go back in time this is Eric Revillius's um, 1935 uh, painting I think it's called Chalk Paths it serves a purpose you want the bare ground you want a lot of management in our chalk landscape or indeed in, in our heathland landscapes for juniper. And I don't know, but you should be able to see lovely chalky paths, lovely chalky banks. There's a, a quarry there perhaps, and there might be a bit of cultivation or uh, erosion there and lovely quarries there. These are all the places that those slow growing junipers want to colonize into. I think the two final things to say about it as a species, and apology, apologies for this picture, is that the first thing is that it's the species that starts scrub succession off in many places. It's an antisocial little blighter of a tree or a bush. Um, it doesn't like growing with other scrub species. So it's the thing that first colonizes uh, a grass and landscape. Um, but then it tends to hand over, it's a bit like a sort of baton race, it hands that baton over to other woody species. And I think it's probably fair to say that in old landscapes, when you had big met populations of juniper, you were getting pulses of regeneration uh, that created what you see here. I think this is Calstone down in Wiltshire. You can see there in the bottom half of the picture, a rather sort of foggy picture of a juniper stand and a pretty pure stand it is too. So when did it regenerate well last? It probably regenerated well last in the mid 50s. Um, we'd had the sort of wartime use of these downlands for training. We'd also had sort of dig for victory and other things that were using these uh, low fertility grasslands to produce meager crops. And when the war was over, the training to some degree stopped, the dig for victory, the ploughing up of these grasslands in some areas at least stopped, and that created that all important bare ground. And apologies for this rather gruesome picture. The other thing to note, though, is that really around about 1953, we see towards the end of 1953, the first cases of myxomatosis in Britain. And within a year, basically every county in Britain uh, had cases of myxomatosis. And we had a situation where 100 million rabbits uh, declined down to very, very few indeed. I think 99% were, were killed off in those first early years. And rabbits and other grazing animals are key uh, in uh, predating those young, slow growing seedlings. So you want bare ground and you don't want heavy ongoing predation by livestock or rabbits and that sort of thing. But there are another few things that matter about juniper conservation. One is that you've really got to have a diverse landscape full of niches. And once you start to get a grassland like this, however beautiful it is, you're not gonna get good juniper regeneration. A second issue, very, very uh, simple, is the usual one for so many species in Britain, plants and animals, is you can see up here, 
a downland. Uh, this one doesn't have juniper. You can see other downlands scattered across the landscape across the top of this picture, but all these downlands that were intact before the, the world wars are now largely plowed up. And you've got this habitat, sorry, I've said succession there, that should be our oh, fragmentation, apologies there. This is the habitat succession one. I mentioned earlier, you've got junipers, they're growing from seeds, they're creating these pure stands of juniper, but they're, they're, they are their own worst enemy. And what happens, we find, is that rabbits go under, in underneath, they disturb the ground, then you get birds landing, and if I can say this, they sort of sit and ship, for want a better term, and you start to get other woody uh, species coming in. This is a, a, a place on the Berkshire Downs, as was, and you can see the junipers uh, quite nice ones there in the background, but this poor one in the foreground, it stays numbered uh, and you can see that they act as a sort of nice climbing frame uh, for, for brambles and then there's a bit of elderberry up there at the top and you get a succession all the way through to yew, white beam um, and eventually um, beech trees as well. So all too often, this is the site with junipers. You've got a, a bit of woodland here. It's secondary woodland. It's probably, at a guess, 30, 40, 50 years old. You've got yew trees in the background. And we don't really want yews here because what they've done is to kill off this juniper. So all too often, us botanists go around sites and see juniper skeletons long dead uh, uh, and long since disappeared. Another issue. Um, We'll talk, uh, Matt will talk a bit more about this, but as these bushes have grown older, um, they're becoming less and less fertile. Uh, and the lack of fertile berries is a real issue with this species today. So you might say to yourself, well, if that's a problem, if they're declining, um, I looked at the BSBI database earlier today, and it looked to me as though there were about 30 colonies only in southern England with 50 or 100 bushes or more still surviving. Many, many colonies are individuals or small groups of plants. They're getting old. They're not producing many berries. They're certainly not producing uh, youngsters. And so an obvious solution might be just to go and plant them. And planting certainly is gives you fairly predictable results. You can see um, ones planted here in tulip tubes from, I guess, cuttings, and they give you quick results. So these were probably, these are on the road into Salisbury. From memory, they were planted about five years ago. This was them this morning. Um, those are the pros, the cons, I think, uh, or the, 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 down, the, the downsides, particularly of using cutting raised plants. One is that you're getting very, very poor variability. People tend to take cuttings of the few most healthy bushes rather than going through a whole population to get propagation material. And my suspicion is that those two bushes you see in this photograph here are bushes that look awfully similar for a very variable plant. And I suspect they've both come from the same um, uh, mother plant. Another problem that gardeners will know about perhaps is when you get um, old things and you take propagation material from old plants, you tend to find that they come with them with a bit of a viral loading, a bit of fungus loading perhaps. So that's another problem. And then you can see other issues there. One of the next problems that we're beginning to worry about is if you take cuttings, take them off to a nursery, grow them in a nursery with dozens of other species around them, there's a possibility that when they come back, they'll come back with Phytophthora. And Phytophthora ostracedri is a real problem these days with juniper populations. Matt's going to say a bit more uh, as well about that. And from my point of view as well, it seems to me that if we introduce these as cutting raised plants and we just do ex situ work on them. When we plant them out, we're simply going to get a situation where we have a, another generation of junipers, but we haven't solved that regeneration problem. We haven't actually yet, you know, we haven't, by doing this, worked out um, or demonstrated or delivered just natural regeneration of this iconic shrub. Going to the final bit then of my little chat, um, we decided that there was a problem with juniper. I, you know, my current view is that we've got a bit like climate change, we've got 10 years to solve it. Otherwise, we've just left it too late down in the south uh, on the downlands in the lowlands. Um, so back in 2009, Tim, there's Tim Wilkins. Uh, he uh, was plant life at that stage. He's now Natural England, but he basically started off Plant Life's pilot project to, to look at juniper regeneration. I, I don't know where I found this bit of 
Tim's note taking, but it serves to tell you that Tim is way more um, uh, a details man than I am, and he was just the right person to set up the project. So the idea was that we wanted to get, we didn't want to go and plant cutting rays or indeed seed rays plants. What we wanted to do was to work out how to get junipers to regenerate naturally or as naturally as possible um, using a couple of techniques. The first technique you see here was to create very expensive, um, rather um, well-made uh, cages that were supposed to be uh, vol-proof. I'm not entirely sure they're vol-proof because it seems to me a vol would pop under there. And these were put into bare patches on downlands. Um, and one or two of them have done really well. There's one in, on Porton Down with 17 bushes within a meter square, uh, sort of fighting for survival. Um, but most of them really didn't work very well at all. These are on the same site before and after. Uh, the after picture is taken about eight or nine years after the first picture was installed. Um, and you can see there that we didn't get any junipers in this case. And in most of these very, very small scale um, sort of one meters, we got really rather bad results. So it's not a very practical method of getting juniper to regenerate. We don't want 17 junipers in one square meter. And you see there that it's getting all overgrown and that one didn't produce any youngsters at all. But what we also did was to look at, um, bigger scrapes, um, scrapes that were typically 20 or 25 meters square. Uh, this is one on Nor Hill, um, and if this would have been created probably in 2009. What we've done is to do two things. One is to scrape away the scrub and the topsoil to reveal the underlying substrate. And the other thing we've done in this case, and that's been taken somewhere else, the other thing we've done is obviously in this particular case to put a sort of um, rabbit and sheep proof uh, or livestock proof fence around the scrape. So um, I'll show you a few pictures of this and tell you the results. Uh, and the thing to watch, um, because things do change surprisingly remarkably, is this ash tree here. Um, so that is it in about 2009. Here you've got it the, the following summer and you're starting to pick up a little bit of regrowth of something there that looks a bit like bramble and what have you. But the, the, the remainder of the scrape proper is pretty damn bare. I think in this case, actually, the spoil has been put around the outside, um, which may explain the next pics, pictures. I probably need to ask Al this, but I think this was either 2017 or 2018. And what we have here, uh, believe me, if I say that the, the stems I'm highlighting in the top left are those same ash trees, we've now got on that spoil really a rather sort of rumbustuous growth of um, uh, scrubby things, and that's not necessarily good. But what you actually get in the heart of the scrape, and this is after eight or nine years, is still some bare areas. We've got this fabulous display of kidney veg, none of its sown. Sorry, I should have explained earlier that the one thing we've sown, sowed into this is berries. We haven't sowed anything else into it, but berries, uh, treated berries, Matt will say a bit more about this, have been sown into this, but nothing else. So we've gone, remove the topsoil, get bare chalk, put the berries in or the, 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 the seeds in and then wait. The rest is occurring naturally. And I think what you start to see here then is a mass. This is on Nor Hill in Hampshire in just above the East Hampshire hangars. You see massed um, kidney veg here. Good for small blues if that site's got good, good small blues. This here is a, a fragrant orchid down in the bottom. You've got a scatter there of slightly paler, uh, common spotted orchids. And then here you've got some pyramidal, pyramidal orchids there as well. And I think this scrape had four species of orchids colonizing within a very small period. Um, we've got a bit of willow coming in here, so that's a worry, but we've also got junipers, um, which is very exciting. Um, Sorry, that didn't sound very excited, very exciting. Um, but what we've got here now, uh, this is again 2014, stepping a bit further back, is you can see the red flags. This is what we wanted to do was to record how successfully the juniper work had done. So this is eight or nine years after that first construction of the, the scrape. The red flags each represent a single juniper bush. And I think what you can see is number one is there's an awful lot of junipers coming up. There's 200, from memory, 252. 
But what's also interesting is in that eight or nine year period, you've got some very, very um, forward uh, junipers, if you like, very quick growing ones. You've got some sort of middling sized ones. You can see here I'm highlighting them, um, which are perhaps three or four years old. And then the, the other red flags are other tiny seedlings. Um, and this uh, picture here is uh, literally about a month ago um, with Andy McVeigh in the photo. Um, it's strange because there's our ash tree with a bit of ash dieback now. We've sort of lost the fence altogether. We've not got a great deal of kidney veg now, but we're getting other nice things coming in. But the other thing that we're getting uh, is this really quite mature grouping of junipers here, and there's others in the scrape. Uh, and you can see how they developed over a sort of nine year or 10 year period. Um, actually it's 10 or 11 years. And just to give you a few bits of information, out of those large scrapes that we created and sowed with seeds, about 80% produced good juniper regeneration. The other three didn't produce anything at all. And we're not entirely sure the other three were actually sown. So it may actually just be that they won't sown, sown there. At the best sites, we had up to 250 or just a few more than that junipers growing, which is way too many for the area involved. Um, even the worst had say 10 or 15 bushes, which is more than enough for this relatively small area. Um, some of those have now reached um, burying size, so we're seeing prolific uh, berries produced on these um, genetically diverse bushes. And as I mentioned earlier, we're getting nice things developing in terms of the flora and fauna. And here's just three quick pictures. Um, the first is this is bear chalk created this year. Matt will say more about this, so I won't say where it is particularly. But you see here um, harebell, campanula, rotundifolia growing. You can see the heavy, you know, the solid bedrock in this case. But things have rooted into that bedrock. In this case, a uh, a harebell, and that's growing very well indeed. So it's going to be flowering uh, next year. It's only been there for three three months. Just to remind you, some of the best scrapes have produced some stunning plants, loads of autumn gentians, loads of carline thistles, yellow wort, and you can see here one of the eyebrights, fragrant orchid and kidney vetch there. And as we look forward, uh, heading, looking ahead, you know, we can expect that you know, we might get the odd stone curlew if the scrapes are big enough, and we could even start to get really, really slow, difficult to keep happy species like pasque flowers and musk orchids and autumn ladies tresses coming into these scrapes. I can't actually read that because it's covered up with my picture and uh, mouse picture, but basically uh, Paul Dolman sums it up really rather well. He's basically saying that we've lost that heterogeneity at all different scales in the countryside. And if we want some of these rarer plants and some of these rarer animals to do well, we've got to start pro uh, providing a wealth of niches at all different scales for them. And if we do that, then as we see in this picture here, then we could turn the fortunes round for juniper. That's it. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. So I'm just going to give you a very quick sort of whistle stop tour of some of the work we've been doing in the last um, last year, really, um, and sort of building really on on that previous work that was done. By the project, and we sort of realised that you know how successful those larger scale scrapes were, um, and there was an opportunity to kind of scale this up. So, and um, we were fortunate enough that the Green Recovery Challenge Fund came along, um, and we were in a position to to put an application in, and we managed to get some money to do some of this work. Um, plus, we've also got healthy donations from from plant life supporters and members. Um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll just just talk about the, the two locations and areas that we worked on, basically, which are um, in Wiltshire. Um, and in uh, Oxfordshire as well. So, so those are those are the two places that we're um, focusing on this year for this project. But we're talking about land conservation really here to, to get juniper back into the landscape. And we're working across a number of sites in both of those locations, at least seven different uh, landowners. And it's all on pr primarily on private land that we're working. Um, so yeah, so it's it's kind of a collaboration really with 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 landowners and farmers in both Wiltshire uh, and and the Oxfordshire area. 
um, the, a lot, the lot of the landscapes there are sort of large, large farms, arable farms, um, and you've got fragments of, of species rich um, grassland and short grassland and scrub and woodland kind of intermixed between these large blocks of arable land, as Andy was mentioning earlier. Um, so I guess these these bits of these parcels of land that are already kind of valuable ecologically for, for, for chalk grassland have, have fragments of surviving juniper in them. Um, the juniper is declining, as Andy mentioned, so there's an opportunity there to work with these landowners and most of the landowners are very much positive about this work. I think mainly because it, it, it's fairly peripheral to their main farm business, which is arable, and, and there's also an incentive for them to manage those bits of land already through countryside stewardship. Um, plus they're part of a farmer network as well. And there's, there's definitely a bit of healthy competition about um, between people about trying to do positive work for the environment and it's definitely a good PR uh, project for people. So I'm just gonna focus here on, on one of the sites um, that, that we worked on it in Wiltshire. Um, if you can see there in the middle there, there's um, one of the, that white blob is one of the original sort of pilot scrapes that was done in, in 2009. Um, and the area we're focusing our work on this year is in that blue circle. Um, and that's what, that's what the, the landscape currently looks like. It's basically reverted back to secondary woodland, um, which is kind of interesting. If we, if we roll the clock back to the 1940s, uh, and we can see that this area was very, very different, um, largely a, a grassland landscape, a, a downland, you know, grassland permanent pasture landscape. Um, and you can see there's a number of tracks running up and down sort of north to south there. And what we've got is a, is a number of sort of probably medieval routeways um, there. That, that, and if you look very closely on this, this grainy area, you can see little specks, which probably are most likely to be juniper that's surviving in that, what was a, a fairly probably intensively managed grassland landscape at that particular time in the 1940s. And as we go through the sort of 20th century grazing pressure becomes less, land gets converted from grassland to arable, um, there's less grazing in the landscape and of course we end up with those areas becoming more wooded and that obviously is to the detriment of the juniper. Unfortunately it becomes, it turns basically into an area of secondary woodland bramble and the juniper is basically starved to blight and starts to kind of suffer because of that. Um, other challenges on some of the other sites that we've been working on as well is, I think Andy mentioned this about rabbits and the predation of, of rabbits, um, particularly on, on regenerating, regenerating juniper. Um, the irony of, of course is that rabbits do create bare ground, which is obviously potentially quite useful for juniper to seed back into if it falls onto those areas of bare ground. But of course, if you've got too much rabbit pressure, as we do on some of the sites that we're trying to work on, any little seedlings that do poke their heads up just get nibbled off by the rabbits. So again, it's an, another sort of challenging, another limiting factor to the regeneration that, that we're trying to get going on some of these sites. And Andy again mentioned this earlier, this um, issue of the um, Phytophthora ostracedri. I mean, this is, a, this is a map here showing the sort of distribution of, of known sites where ostracedri has, has been confirmed. Um, as far as we're aware, there's only a very, very small number in the south of England. Um, but obviously it's, it's a concern for us um, when we're doing this kind of work and something that we have to be really mindful of. Um, the, the pathogen is, is spread through water. Um, I mean, luckily most of the landscapes we're working on are fairly dry. So that's probably gonna, gonna reduce the, the, the impact and the spread of, of Phytophthora ostracedri. But again, as Andy mentioned, if we're moving material and taking cuttings, which we are as part of this project, I mean, there's potential that we could be moving that, that pathogen um, to somewhere else through that, that process of cutting. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to try and minimize the risk of that later on. So uh, here's an example of, of a site that we've, we've worked on. Um, I think Andy mentioned that a lot of these sites where you find juniper existing in the landscape today are often old historic places. Um, they are old sunkways, they're old trackways, they're places that have historically been disturbed. Um, this is an old sunkway running up the edge of a field in Wiltshire. Um, typically a place that would have had bare ground just because of traffic moving up and down. Of course, it's no longer in use. It's become scrubbed over and it's become completely in encased in grass as well. So this is a really good potential opportunity, a place to kind of reintroduce uh, juniper back into the landscape. So some work's been done on this particular location to try and 
create the ideal conditions really for juniper and of course that's really about the removal of this scrub and secondary woodland and the creation of the bare ground habitat that juniper really likes because it is this kind of successional early successional plant species that comes in fairly quickly and it needs that bare ground so um, first of all we're removing the scrub um, primarily done with small diggers um, mainly because they have limited amount of impact on on the existing turf around this site because we've got other nice species uh, grassland species around the site so we need to be quite careful and cautious about how we do the work um, so that's that's the site uh, this summer as, as the scrub was being removed and then we've really kind of almost reverted it back to probably how it would have been when it was being used more by traffic so you know we would have been bare ground and, and exposed soil um, so we've scraped away that turf layer and some of that topsoil to try and reveal some of that more rubbly chalk um, and then this area will be sown with with seed that's been collected from some of the local bushes um, in the nearby landscape. So this is going back to that aerial photograph that I showed you um, at the beginning. So this is the site from the ground. Um, so up running up that hill there you've got these old historic medieval roots um, land all around has mostly been converted to arable still got a bit of um, grassland on the left hand side there um, but of course over that period of probably 60 or 70 years of this you know this land use change less and less grazing that area reverts to secondary woodland it doesn't get ploughed because the ground is too uh, too difficult to plough so it doesn't get converted to arable so you've got juniper surviving there but of course the juniper basically starts to get completely overshadowed but as the trees and the scrub start to take over in that location um, so again we've got old and dying bushes underneath this woodland um, so again an opportunity to try and a restore a juniper landscape and get some bare ground established but also potentially create a load more grassland or chalk grassland at the same time um, and this is on, a, on the edge of a triple si site as well so so quite a sensitive site where we've already got existing nice species so the work that was done primarily was uh, cutting back of scrub and the secondary woodland. This was done in February of this year. Um, I think we were clearing about probably around two hectares of secondary woodland and scrub um, to expose some of those existing juniper bushes which are still alive, but also to create some bare ground where we can sow some seeds back into as well. So that's uh, uh, kind of gives you an idea about what it looks like still quite a lot of trees we've probably removed about 80 percent of the trees and scrub from that area um, and you can start to see now though those kind of lumps and bumps of those kind of old um, sort of medieval tracks that are running up the side of the hill there um, a slightly closer shot there um, you can see juniper just in the very far background of that photograph there in the middle uh, juniper just about surviving in a patch where the sunlight still gets through so uh, the hope is that we'll be able to sow some more juniper seeds that we've collected again from the local bushes in the site and we'll get more juniper regeneration um, on some of these sunk ways where we've got some bare ground exposed as well so and of course coming back um, it's surprising how quickly as soon as you kind of allow light onto what is what was quite a bare earth um, environment how quickly some of the chalk grassland species recover um, so the site was cleared of vegetation in February um, and by May we've already got things like cowslips um, and, and some orchids already coming back into that site amazingly quickly. So it's, it's amazing how quickly these things will, will change and recover once you let the light back in. Um, so, so the site again here will be sown with, with um, seed um, in the coming few months um, and then we'll be monitoring that site over the next few years to see how well the juniper um, gets going in that, that location. So here's another example of another site. Um, this one is in Oxfordshire, um, the Oxfordshire Downs. Again, a really, really big population of junipers here. Probably well over a thousand junipers surviving in this piece of downland. Again, this piece of downland has somehow survived because most of the land around it is arable uh, now. And this, I guess, was probably too steep. Um, to be arable so continued to be grazed at, 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 you know as more traditional sort of downland um, but of course over time that grazing has become less and less um, as Andy said those birds have pooped on there and you started to get bramble and scrub and trees and secondary woodland starting to encroach and you can see large areas of bramble um, and also secondary woodland starting to completely smother out some of the you know this what is an old juniper population um, other challenges on this site as well, 
Um, so it's an aging population of juniper. You've got the secondary woodland and the bramble. Uh, you've also got quite a high rabbit population here as well. So that again, if there is any seed that does fall onto bare ground, um, the likelihood is the rabbits are gonna nibble it off. So um, lots of challenges on this site. So again, an, an opportunity to try and do something. Uh, so first thing we're, we're doing here is to clear that bramble and that secondary woodland scrub to try and open up some areas that we're gonna then scrape back to bare areas. Um, using one of these clever devices, this is a, what they call a, a robot flail. It's sort of operated a bit like a, a drone or a remote control car. The guy there is, is literally operating it um, with a little remote control. So he doesn't, need to, he doesn't need to be sitting on the machine. It means it can go on very steep banks without worrying about an operator, which is obviously really useful for downland. Um, it's also quite a small and, but yet quite a powerful machine as well, which means it can get into quite tight spaces and get between the juniper. Um, and because it's powerful, it can also chop up um, and flail up actually quite large scrub and trees. Um, so, so actually, and, it, and it's also quite fast at doing that. If you were trying to do this manually by hand, I mean, it would be months and months and months of work. So a relatively cost-effective approach to trying to remove scrub off these difficult, inaccessible sites. Uh, so yeah, there you can see now that same piece of downland with some of the scrub and bramble removed. Um, we've still got quite a lot of work to do on this site, of course, because what we've got there is a load of organic matter that's been that's been flailed and spread on the site from all the all the scrub and bramble that's been chopped. So um, the next step is to come in there and scrape that away. And um, so we scrape away all the organic matter, and then we'll also scrape away some of that topsoil as well to expose some of the chalk, so that we again can do the sowing of the berries and collecting berries from the site to spread across that location. So we've also put scrapes into other areas as well, adjacent really to, to some of the, the, these old and aging populations. Um, and again, sort of careful selection of locations, either adjacent or in between um, existing populations of juniper. And sometimes where we know there were historic populations of juniper very nearby as well. So, so it's again, trying to create that, that bare ground for that successional habitat. So, um, and again, carefully choosing locations where we know there aren't lots and lots of, there's not a lot of other botanical interest in the grassland, so we're not, we're not destroying other habitat at the same time. But of course, it's adjacent to other potentially species-rich grasslands, so we know that there will be that opportunity for some of those plants to seed back into these areas of bare ground through natural succession. Um, and one of the challenges, I think Andy mentioned this, was about the, the moving of the soil, because um, we're obviously scraping away the topsoil, which is quite fertile, and we don't necessarily want to leave that um, in these locations, partly because of aesthetic reasons, but partly because it's going to encourage scrub and, and some of the plants that we might not want to grow back. We're obviously trying to encourage, you know, some of these chalk grass and specialists would tend to grow on, on the bare chalk and on the very infertile soil. So if we can remove that topsoil away. Um, and of course, we were lucky enough that we were working with farmers and landowners on these sites. And of course, they had arable land and they had the ability and, and we were able to get most of this, the topsoil removed and then spread um, on their arable land so, so that it's not such a problem in, in these um, scrape situations. So again another another site this one's again in uh, Wiltshire so again you can sort of see the, the extent and the sort of landscape scale of, of the work. Um, this site was was possibly formerly arable land um, probably in the in the 50s and 60s. It was reverted back to grassland at some point um, but again, historically, there was um, there was juniper growing in 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 these fields here, on this piece of downland. Um, in the very very far distance, you've got a, another another triple SI, uh, which has got very nice chalk grassland. And behind us, um, in this photograph, we've got another the other triple SI with a lot of juniper in it. So again, we're trying to make that connection between these two bits of fragmented bits of triple SI. Um, one with juniper in it, one without juniper, but both with really good chalk grassland. Um, so again, scraping off or choosing carefully the locations in here to put these scrapes into. Um, sowing the seeds um, that have been collected from, from the nearby juniper and then waiting for some of those um, chalk grassland species to find their way in from, from these other existing areas of chalk grassland that, that are either side of this site. Uh, Andy mentioned about collecting of berries, which is um, quite a slow and laborious task. So um, 
part of the process obviously is about getting um, natural regeneration going and giving it a helping hand is by this process of collecting and processing the berries. Um, so we've been working with Q, the Millennium Seed Bank, who have been helping us with the processing of the berries. Um, there is no easy, quick way to do this, unfortunately. Um, there's no clever mechanical way of doing it either. It's all, it's all kind of slow and, and, and quite hard work. Um, what you tend to find is that on, on a juniper bush, um, you will have berries from a number of years still, sort of still holding onto the bush. So you may have berries from the previous year, the brown and shriveled berries there you can see. Um, and you may also have the ripe plump berries, which are this year's berries, which are, are the ones we want. Um, and then you'll also have green berries, which are, are obviously berries that have grown this year and still are not still to ripen. Um, and it's quite tricky to harvest berries um, from bushes without collecting a bit of everything, as you can see here. And also what you find is quite a lot of the needles fall off as well. So it, it's there's a work, there's a whole load of work to be done to kind of clean that up and process that to get to the seeds. Typically, you get two to three seeds inside one of those plump berries. Um, and one method that, that kind of we we kind of worked out, I think, from the original work that was done by Tim in, in, the, in the 2000s was that actually um, you need to get the flesh off the berries um, and putting it through something like this. This is just a, an old hand mincer is a really good way of kind of mushing up and, and removing the flesh and then kind of exposing the seeds from from within those berries. Again, you know, pretty, pretty labor intensive and time consuming, but obviously really important to, to, to get the berries from from the seeds if we want to get them to establish well. Um, and then a process of, of washing all that flesh away um, and then drying as well. So, so yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a time consuming and laborious process to kind of harvest and process the berries ready to then sow them back out on these juniper scrapes. Um, and Q are also helping us with um, high technology. Um, it allows them to, to actually um, x-ray the seeds, um, which means we can, we can more accurately check the viability of, of, of the seed that's been collected. Um, which is really useful um, and of course once we do start to look at some of the berries that we're bringing back we you know we we can see that some of the challenges are that actually a lot of this a lot certainly some of the sites we're working on the, the viability of the seed is low and of course that's partly why some of these species are struggling to regenerate along with all those other issues that we've kind of mentioned so quite a few challenges um, and finally um the other side of this, uh, I guess a little bit of an insurance policy, I know Andy, Andy sort of mentioned that we're, we're kind of much keener on the idea of, of doing the natural regeneration, the collecting of the seed and the sowing, and we, we know from our previous experience in the mid-2000s how successful that's been, particularly on these larger scale scrapes, which is mainly why we put these big scrapes back into the landscape. Um, but we're also, we have also gone through a process of, of, of taking cuttings as well um, from quite large quantities of healthy juniper bushes. Um, and they've been taken away to a specialist uh, nursery. Um, so I think we took around two and a half thousand cuttings um, at the back end of last year and approximately I think we've now got around 1500 healthy cuttings that have taken root and are with the nursery. Um, but you can see they are pretty small at the moment. Um, so they, they, they've been on those pots for less than a year, um, too small to plant back out in, in the landscape. Um, particularly without any sort of protection for, from herbivores and rabbits and other grazing. Um, so the plan is to keep those in the nursery for another year and let them grow on. Um, but if we do that, it also gives the chance to, to look out for the, uh, the pathogen, the um, Phytophthora astrocedri as well, um, just to make sure that we're not putting out juniper bushes that potentially have got that pathogen. It will also give us the chance to go and test any of any of the suspected bushes, so we can, we can actually send them off to the lab to be tested, just to make sure, double check that we're not we're not spreading that pathogen around to, to other locations where we're trying to get juniper re-established. Yeah, I mean that that's really all I wanted to say. But just just to mention, you know, like I said at the, at the outset, that you know the work that, that we've been doing over the last year has been funded by Defra, which is from, from this Green Recovery Challenge Fund. Um, and also from, from, you know, generous donations from Plant Life members and supporters. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you very, very much indeed, Matt and, and Andy. Um, you always, I'm always slightly worried that I have actually found the unmute button, so I'm hoping you can, you can hear me again. Matt might give me a thumbs up if he can hear me. 
Yes, that's great. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Um, you know, fantastic piece of work that that um, has been pulled together very quickly, particularly in the Wiley Valley where, where, where Matt's been working most recently. Um, um, we've got a little bit of time for some questions and we've got a few come in. So um, in no particular order, um, and, and please keep them coming if you've got others as well. Um, Richard has asked um, what particular species um, other species might appreciate the resurgence of, of, of juniper in the landscape. Andy, you talked a little bit about some of the other um, plant species that we've found in some of the trials. Um, anything you can add about other, other taxa in invertebrates and butterflies in particular and, and, and how this might help, for the, help them? I think the first thing to say is that juniper itself is um, a sort of host plant of a whole host of fungi uh, and invertebrates and that sort of thing. So don't quote me on the figures, but I think something like 100 to 200 different species are actually reliant on juniper, um, just living on the bushes themselves. But the value of things like the scrapes is that I th a lot of, um, most plants, it seems to me, require bare grounds to regenerate in at some, you know, at the very first stages of their lives. Um, and I think that succession, taking it back to sort of um, square one, taking it back to bare chalk is a good way of starting that succession and over probably a 20 or 30 year period you're just going to have a lovely fine grassland with the little tussocks of um, sheep's fescue for example and you'll start to get some of the annual species like yellow wort and carline thistle and some of the um, uh, gentian and as the felwers coming in. Um, the, the sides that we've worked on have had stunning shows of things like horseshoe vetch and kidney veg, which are obviously food plants for things like the chalk hill blue, Adonis blue, small blue, and that sort of thing. Um, I think we're going to get the conditions right for silver spotted skipper. So I'm hoping that as they, they seem to be spreading in certain bits of Britain, they seem to be declining in other bits of Britain, but I'm hoping that we might do well with silver spotted skipper. So, um, you know, a, a scrape that was done at Nore Hill slightly before the plant life one now has things like autumn ladies tresses coming in and I think some of our very rarest um, chalkland plants things like purple milk vetch, a pasc flower, musk orchid are things uh, and indeed um, field, flea, uh, fell wort, field flea wort and I can't think of any others um, they should start to sort of move in as this very raw bare chalk starts to sort of succeed through to a nice open um, the friable mix of chalk and perennial grasses. Right, thanks, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know we we've seen in revisiting some of them. You know, you walk across some of these scrapes, and they're just they're just lovely, aren't they? I mean, fantastic you know, sort of variety and things. Um, I, I'm I'm going to throw the next question at, 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 at Matt, which is an interesting one, which has come from Helen Fry, and 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 we'll all sort of Andy and Matt and I will all smile at this one a little bit. Was Helen's asked, do we get vandalized? Do, do we get accused of vandalizing the area when we're doing some of this work? And, <laughs> and I think it is something that we're quite aware of. That is drastic taking areas back down to, uh, to to bare chalk. I'm going to let Matt come in in a minute. I think one of the things that's been fantastic with the trials that were done back in 2009 um, is that we're able to actually show. Well, yes, it does look quite stark when you do it, but just look at what you get. And and all of those scrapes have, have, have recovered well. But Matt, over to you. Have you been accused of vandalism? uh not as yet no <laughs> um but <laughs> you know you never know do you you never know but i think i think you know once people understand what we're doing and, and a lot of people you know clearly know their locality quite well and, and on the sites where we've been working there are you know people that there's footpaths and there's public access all over and of course you tend to get the regular people that walk their dogs up there and you know people are interested and want to know what we're doing and, and generally once we explain what we're doing and that some of them know about juniper so a lot of them don't know how rare it is and, uh, you know, and how much of a decline it's happened, you know, that, that it's in. Um, but once we explain, you know, the work that's been done before and how successful it's been, I think most people are, are, are fairly um, sympathetic to that. And I think we're also trying to think about where we cite these things as well in terms of an aesthetic. Um, you know, we're not, we're not trying to make them too obvious. We're trying to put them in places and we're trying to make them look as, as kind of, I mean, the same natural as possible. That, that's a, a strange word for digging a hole and <laughs> scraping out of bare soil, but, you know, trying to make them, yeah, blend in as much as possible. That's part of the reason for removing some of that material as well, that, that topsoil, rather than just kind of leaving it in the landscape. So they will kind of blend in over time as they start to revegetate. And it will add something, I'm sure, to that. 
I think the only thing I was going to add was that, in a sense, I think if we'd seen a chalk landscape, say, 100 or 200 years ago, there was there was far more in the way of just bare chalk in that landscape. There would have been small chalk pits. Um, the sunk ways would have, you know, these hollow ways, call them what you will, would have been used. I remember bravely and unsuccessfully fighting the Winchester bypass um, uh, inquiry years ago, um, which sort of dates me. But there, um, the the, by, uh, the 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 motorway um, went through this fabulous series of sunken ways, which were created as stock was taken from um, the market town of Winchester up onto the downs across to Petersfield, and you had these sunken ways that were many many meters deep and beautiful and you just think of all the iron age forts all these different things would have and and of course the rotational fallows that were punched into chalk grassland by sort of people trying to sort of make a get a crop out out of this poor land and then it would have reverted back to to grassland so we've lost that we've been a bit sort of like a, we've homogenized the landscape softly, really. to some extent haven't we i think that's what yeah we've you know. And we've become a bit sort of softly, softly with, you know, we've got so little chalk downland left. Um, we've tried to protect that. And I, I think in, in some ways we've, we've done it a disservice. But now we're getting stewardship, creating new grassland areas um, from arable. It seems to me that would be one very good place where we could be punching more bare chalk back into the landscape. Great, thank you. Thanks both. I've got a couple of questions um, from from Madeline. Uh, one was was actually what the symptoms of Phytophthora are, and and I, I, I sort of point people who haven't noticed yet because it, it's not you know necessarily that clear. But the, there are there are links in the chat, and one of the links is to a, a lot more detail about Phytophthora. Um, and, and I'd sort of point people at that if they're interested in, in, in the symptoms. Matt, do you want to say anything about that in particular? I, I can talk a little bit yeah. about that, but I would say it's probably best to, to recheck and there are, some, there are some photographs on, but I mean, one of the symptoms is, is the bushes starting to die back. Um, so in effect browning, um, but it tends to be the symptoms also are lesions on, on the base, on the stem of the bush as well. Um, but some of the symptoms are not so obvious um, without actually starting to cut the bush and look at the, the um, Look, look under the bark because it's it's the damage to, under the bark that, that is more obvious but um, there's more there's more detail on the website about that so I think the challenge is that there are a number of other diseases as well that that, that can affect juniper so so a bush may be dying back but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is phytophthora astra so great thanks Matt thank you so yeah that you know that guidance is really useful um the other question from Madeline it was you know how we how we plan to maintain these areas over time given the scapes that we're creating are relatively small although some of the other areas are, are bigger um Matt Andy who wants to take that one shall I give right. it a go um give it a go, go for Andy when we first sort of designed the the trial project um obviously we had those meter squares and they had to be protected from rabbits because um, they were such tiny areas and they didn't really work very well because they're just too small. Um, but there was a bit of a thinking that what we want to be able to do is create easily and cheaply and cost effectively much bigger areas. Um, and one of the reasons for doing that is that we want to create them these bare patches sufficiently big um, in a, at a big scale sort of thing. So A, they didn't succeed too quickly to grassland. Um, but the other reason was that there was a thinking that if we got them to be big enough, um, then actually they might be sufficiently big and uh, exposed that rabbits and other animals wouldn't really want to go in them to, to, um, uh, to sort of graze. And we found with uh, the original trials at Wiley Valley, for example, that the, the site wasn't fenced. It was about 25 metres square. Um, it's got about 50 or I think it's 52, 62 or something juniper bushes coming up in it. It was never fenced. Um, there are rabbits there, but they haven't eaten them off. So um, we're very much hoping that as we up the scale of the work, then uh, the rabbits won't come in. Um, and one of the things we've done over the Wiley area, for example, is to put in these scrapes on six different land holdings. I think there's a total of about five hectares of scrapes across the land. Um, and one of them, for example, is now shown on the Ordnance Survey map for sort of posterity. Um, and so we've got them scattered across something like a six by two, two kilometer area, a little bit thinny perhaps, but you know, we've now got to find the berries to sow in those areas. And I'm hoping that the good majority of them will produce good junipers. 
think we're also work, you know land working with those landowners as well clearly you know engaged landowners that are keen on conservation and um, we're also trying to put these in areas where there's already some conservation value or on the periphery of of that so you know the likelihood is that these will get supported through the new elm scheme as well so you know there will be some sort of hopefully there'll be some ongoing support for landowners to, to kind of manage these particularly as juniper's a you know an important plant in these in these locations so i think that's a really good point as well matt that, that you know we couldn't have done any of this work that you're currently involved in without you know it's not our land it's privately owned land it's farm owners land and we've been you know dead chuffed to be honest about how those farmers have have you know have have approached it and how keen many of them are and and to the extent where some of them are actually you know some of their neighbors are now saying hang on why wasn't i involved which is great and so i think that's a you know a real positive um uh, you know one of the things with it being quite drastic and going back down to to, to bear chalk is that this this isn't then something that sort of instantly turns over the next couple of years back into a sort of into a thick sward again so this is something that has got a bit of longevity to it but you're quite right, Madeline, that we do need to look for mechanisms that, that continually sort of provide this sort of disturbance for, for, for germination niches, niches for juniper. If I could just go on now to um, uh, two questions, which I thought, it, you know, at some point we get into gin at, at some point this evening. I, maybe some of you already got a, a glass there. But of course, you know, gin is flavoured with juniper berries. And I've got a, a question here from Fiona Lunn um, as just to how, how involved or if, it, if the, the, the gin industry is involved in some funding any of this work. And in particular, um, Fiona's pointed us at, at, at Oxfordshire gin company which I hadn't heard from before but so we shall be taking note of that Fiona um, and and sort of in the same sort of ally to that Lucy has also sort of asked the question of um, you know where do the, uh, the the UK gin producers get their juniper berries from so Matt Andy who, who wants to sort of pick either of those up or I'll give it a go yeah <laughs> yeah, and Alan knows everything. <laughs> what we do know from one of the companies was that um, British uh, juniper berries, number one is there's not very many of them. There's a sort of conservation issue about running off with all the berries um, for gin. Um, but we did ask one company whether you could use uh, juniper berries for gin production. And they sort of said they were, they're actually stronger and better if you get them from sort of Mediterranean countries. So I've got a feeling they're coming from the Balkans, Romania and that sort of thing. Estonia, I believe, and, isn't it? Mm, Estonia, where was that? I think so. Yeah. Um, so I think that the, 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 we thought you could sort of almost have downlands with lots of juniper and use it sort of as a, a wild crop, but at the same time, time have lovely pasque flowers below. But um, the <laughs> juniper berries are just a bit insipid in Britain. <laughs> which is a slightly negative thing but 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 having said all of that the gin industry as we all know is is, is pretty enormous and there is a very clear link with juniper <coughs> berries and and it is something we're looking very closely at is how we can uh you know bring the gin industry into this conservation issue because as andy said in his talk you know we've probably got 10 or 15 years a lot of these stands are in their 80s 90s 100 year old and in some ways they look healthy because they're still standing up and they're green, but um, there are, there's, there's no youngsters coming along behind them. So, and that leads, us, leads me on to sort of saying that, you know, we, we're working across two landscapes at the moment and we're very much looking um, for other, other ways of replicating that work, whether other landowners and, and other organisations would like to, to sort of take what we've done and, and, and work on that themselves. And also in us identifying other, other landscapes and other areas where we can do the same, because uh, what we'd like to do and what we've set ourselves a challenge to do is, is, is to catalyse the sort of recovery and the, and, the, and the security of juniper in the lowlands for the future, because it is a species which is sadly going to disappear otherwise. Um, I think we've pretty much, um, I think I've hopefully I've covered most of the questions. Actually, I've got, I've got one other one that, that from, from Richard, maybe quickly, Andy, that, that and, and, and also um, I, th I think uh, one from Jacqueline, which has sort of linked. So, so Richard was sort of saying, you know, have we got an international responsibility for juniper in the UK? Um, how important are our populations? And Jacqueline's just making the point that there's, you know, there's hardly any in Cornwall, is there? But I know there's a little population that you, you're in love with in Cornwall, Andy. So um, do you want to give us a quick couple of minutes on that? And then we'll... um, Cornwall, deal with that one first. Um, the 
in Cornwall, it's always been very, very rare. So in the south of Britain, it tends to be a thing of chalk and limestone. Uh, it used to occur on some of our heathlands. So there are, I think, about three bushes surviving on the on the new forest. Um, and if you go onto some of the commons on the Chilterns, you find it uh, places like Burnham Beaches and Nap Hill Common. So it will survive on acid in the south. But the problem in the south is that probably heathland burning in particular um, has tended to get rid of juniper. It doesn't regenerate if you burn it. It just sort of bubbles away in its resins and dies. Uh, so that was the end of it in the in the acid areas in the south. On Cornwall is largely acid. I think it's got very, very little um, limestone. So <coughs> the only known native colony is a, a rather special colony of about 20 native bushes down in one valley on the lizard, uh, on the western lizard. It's prostrate. It's a thing called uh, subspecies Hemispherica, and it's been there. It's been there for over a hundred years, and that was a long time uh, before that. Um, so that's the sort of Cornwall thing. Do you want to give the um, world situation a go, Matt, or shall I? I think you probably ought to, Andy. I um, say. <laughs> slightly embarrassing. Embarrassingly, there are places in Finland and beyond where it's a bit of a, uh, a pest. Um, so <laughs> they clear it like we clear blackthorn and hawthorn. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it, it is a widespread species through Europe. I think it's more common these days in the northern bits of Europe where you've still got big sort of pine forests and heathlands and heath under pine. Um, it is sort of being systematically destroyed in some of the limestone and chalky areas of Western Europe because they're being ploughed up. So um, the time will come when it's rare on the continent as well and it will suddenly become something that's near threatened and then vulnerable and then they'll panic like we are. But it's the loss of this landscape and it's the loss of these sort of cultural uh, management systems that, that will ultimately do for it. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Andy and Matt, for I thought what were fantastic, fantastic um, talks. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, do take a look again at the at the YouTube channel. I think Becky's put the, 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 the links on that and you will get a follow up email with with some of the links as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope you've enjoyed the, the, the evening. I, I think some of us may go off for a gin now just to sort of support the gin industry. Thank you very, very much again for, for, for joining us and all the very best.